just scrolling through the questions. Uh, do you want okay, to... here I am. One, two, three. Audio. One, two, three. Mike, and you got me. Is that right? Do you have me, Mike? One, two, three. Live. One, two, three. Da 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 da. You don't look like you have me yet in your audio feed. So, I'm continuing to talk. Or you can't tell. Okay, thank you. Now, Adam, your turn. Testing. Yeah, it's testing. All, it's all the same. OperaX right. live office hours. All right. Audio still up. You're just going to keep us live and do the show? Yeah. I think so. Did we come up with a theme song yet or not? Nope. No. Should I do the introduction again? Uh -huh. Same How way we did it. Okay. Yeah. Are we, are we rolling right now? Oh, oh, nice. Hey, well, sorry about that. <laughs> Whoops. Those of you out there, we didn't realize that we were live. So, yeah, we are live here. You don't see us yet, but here we are. Steve Swain. Uh, meeting you from Dartmouth College for our second live office hour. And next to me is Adam Nemiroff, also joining from Dartmouth College. So, um, welcome to Opera X live office hours. This is our second Opera live office hours for the course, uh, and we're here live from the Innovation Studio at Dartmouth College. Um, so, a couple brief housekeeping things um, as we're looking to the hangout today. Uh, to ask a question during the hangout. You'll see there's a Q&A tool in Google Hangouts on the sidebar. Uh, feel free to add in your questions into there, and our memory and Mike will make sure it gets into our, our queue of course questions. Um, you can also use the discussion forum uh, to add your questions as well that we've designated for the live office hour. So we have a couple of brief community reminders, which I think will be a helpful point to get started. As well um, as talking about some of the landmarks we're having, you know, just about reaching, uh, for example, Facebook. But go ahead. Yeah, we'll talk Facebook and badges. It'll be some fun. So some brief reminders. Uh, we've had a lot of questions in the discussion board around the opera tuning assignments. So we want to take a couple of moments just to clarify a couple of things with that. Um, as of just before the Hangout, we're updating the due dates for the opera tuning assignments. Um, for any submission after today, the due date will be November 24th, uh, 2015. Uh, we want to give people, there's a lot of people joining our course um, as, we're, as we're off and running, and that's great. Welcome to the course. Uh, but we want to allow people enough time to do some of those assignments. And to get caught up. And make sure their peers can give them feedback. Right. Um, so also, as we've mentioned in the past, keep checking back for peer reviews uh, peer review opportunities with your, as your peers are turning in assignments. Uh, we've had a couple of questions about the rubric and grading. Uh, we'll also get to that a little bit later on, contextually in a specific question. We've had a lot of great feedback from our, our active discussion participants in the course about different ways of thinking about pinned posts and starter posts. We're going to be trying this out with week four, which will launch tomorrow morning. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. We'll be pinning some of the things that we find interesting, some of the things we think you'll find helpful as you're going through the course experience. And we'll be setting up starter posts. That way, you'll have an opportunity to build off of and, and more easily see what others are saying about, about the topics in the course. 
Badges are also going really well in the course. Uh, so as we've mentioned in the past, you have the opportunity to earn community badges. Uh, these are all under the community badges part of the, the course navigation on the left side. Uh, specific shout out, we have a couple of students uh, giving us some uh, badges or some submissions for the badge this week. Um, so we have Jenna or Yana, I'm not, I'm not sure, Sabrina and Marie have all posted questions on the discussion board or in the Hangouts app for this Hangout specifically. And so they should be receiving a badge shortly for that accomplishment. Congratulations to Congratulations you. Congratulations to you All three of you. All three of you. Um, one other thing, so our Facebook page is, is doing quite nicely. We are one person shy. Mike, if you want to show the, yeah, we're one person shy of 500 likes. Well, it said 500 likes right there. So did somebody just like us? Oh, that's, it's telling us that's the milestone we're getting Oh, that's the milestone, okay. So somebody in this Hangout, please like us on Facebook. Push, <laughs> us, push us over the 500 mark. Thank you, yeah. And there's some great conversations emerging there. Uh, we have some photos from the course community. Um, I put in one of mine too. It's just that's okay. Just to mention, so we have uh, Jennifer Thompson, who's been joining us on several of the the hangouts and has been an active course participant. You might have seen her picture earlier in the week two update, or the week three update rather. Um, so she's sharing out watching a clip from Orfeo uh, with some Halloween theme in the background. Appropriate decorations, indeed. Well, I mean, and that particular production of Hollow of uh, sorry of Orfeo is a little bit spooky in part, so mm. I can I can understand that uh, New England tree in the background uh, uh, has a, a particular resonance for that. Uh, but maybe Jennifer is going to become an opera director herself. Exactly. Um, and I shared out a picture. I was recently in Newport this past weekend, Newport, Rhode Island, in the northeastern part of the United States. And we stayed at a hotel that had a letter from the Metropolitan Opera in the entryway. I thought this was kind of funny. It was uh, thanking the uh, Hotel Viking for hosting a bunch of cast members and, and met affiliates uh, for a festival in Newport in the late 1960s. So I thought that was totally cool and had to share that out. So be sure to send us your, your pictures of as you're engaging with opera or seeing opera. Uh, coming into play, uh, yeah. Adam, you were just mentioning about a commercial that you just saw recently that used the overture to La Noce di Figaro as part of the music. So there's a lot of opera stuff happening out there uh, within our course and outside our course. And let's hear from you about those kinds of things. And share them out with the Opera X hashtag if, if you would do so. Uh, we would love to hear some of these stories. All right. So now on to your questions. The first one we've got is from Sadie T. The reasons behind the conventions. In the past, I've observed various operatic conventions and just accepted them at face value. An opera has an overture, divas sing spectacular arias, the story advances through recitative, but I've never stopped to think about why these conventions take the form they do. Now I'm curious to know the why behind the convention. Knowing that will add another layer to my experience as I listen to opera. Great so, question. Yeah, that's what I wrote in my notes here. A wonderful question. And the quickest answer to the question is that uh, conventions exist to channel audience and performer expectations. And um, I often say that if music uh, fulfills all of our expectations, we would get bored. So there has to be some novelty. But if there were no expectations whatsoever, if it blows through all the things we expect, uh, we get confused. And so these conventions allow us to expect, you know, know what follows next. So, uh, and they come together over time. They weren't, you know, uh, to use a different uh, usage of the word, there wasn't a convention to decide the conventions. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, impresarios and composers noticed, hey, things seem to work better when we have an operatic overture. Things seem to work better when we use arias in this particular way or have recitative do these kinds of things. And so now we have the opportunity of looking, listening to these operas and understanding that these conventions exist. And I would hope that that expands our, the enjoyment of, of those moments where we say, ah, that's the cabaletta, ah, that's the cadenza, ah, that, there's the overture and this is what it's doing. Yeah, and I think that definitely helps as far as the strategies with listening to as you start to become more aware of those conventions happening. So uh, a question that we thought would build off of that whole question of conventions 
comes from Jennifer K. Thompson, who asked the question about uh, more or less, do we believe in progress when we are talking about music? So we had a time where there were no conventions, uh, conventions get put in place. Is that progress or what would we call that? Yeah, and I was thinking, Steve and I were talking a bit about this before the Hangout. I, I think for me, week two is almost like pre-conventions. So, I, I mean, to summarize yeah. the question, uh, Jennifer is asking about, you know, week two. Why did we have week two? Yes. Yeah, so the and why. then the question about, you know, are we talking about development, evolution, progress? You can see the question there on the screen. So, yes, you know, week two. Yeah, so one of the things that, that we talked about early on with designing the course was week two sets up this interesting opportunity to talk about some of the things that are coming before Mozart and how Mozart builds off of those things, but then the way that others are building off of those ideas later on. So I always thought of the history of Mozart, the history of opera before Mozart in week two as being almost like pre-conventions. Uh, they're a way of starting to associate some of these commonalities that we're seeing across the different performances and the way that, that they're being put together. Right. And in Jennifer's question, she, she also builds on the, my choice of the metaphor of a car yeah. and, and wonders in choosing that metaphor, I may be reading too much into the question, you know, our, you know cars have evolved. And so are we saying that the car of today better, is, yeah. is better than the car of 100 years ago? Is it uh, more perfect than the car of 100 years ago? And so can we apply those kind of things to uh, Mozart versus Monteverdi? And I'll, I'll let you know that you know, music does change over time, just as cars do. But I, I am loath to say that you know, this car is better than that car. There are many people who would love a, a Pierce Arrow from a long time ago and, and, exactly. and sing its praises the same way that there are many people today who they go to, let's say, uh, the, uh, the coronation of Popea of you know, Monteverdi's last opera and, and just love that opera. And other people would be a little bit uh, put off or don't know exactly how to handle that. So the car metaphor was to give us another way of looking at um, how different kinds of vehicles, both a physical car as well as operatic vehicles, may, may meet our expectations, may not fulfill our expectations. So the question of conventions again. But it's not to say that Mozart is more perfect than Monteverdi was, right. or Verdi is more perfect than Mozart was. Uh, there's a wide continuum here. So if you like Puccini more than you like Monteverdi, no problem. If vice versa is true, that's quite that's that's great too. But um, I I would be loath to say that opera gets better over time. It just changes over time. Mm. Great question. Okay, so. Um, we talked about one Orpheus, uh, Monteverdi's, but uh, we have a person, uh, Penny and the Devil, a well, very interesting uh, handle there, uh, asking a question about the other Orpheus that we looked at. Yeah, so um, her, their question, uh, when Kefaro Senza Erudice was included in one of the lectures, I noticed that I already knew it, but by the title of a French version of it. Um, can you tell me when this aria was translated and by whom? Was it by Gluck, Gluck, maybe for the French audience or after his death? Was the entire opera translated or just this particular aria? I take it the Italian one is the original. Which version, which version is more commonly performed today? So let me take that last part. Which version is more commonly performed today? And just say you know, we don't have a database at our fingertips that would uh, explore what all the opera houses in the United States and the world are doing. As it happens, the Gluck is not performed as much as Mozart's from Mozart's time forward. Uh, so now to answer the question about the French version versus the Italian version, the Italian version, um, Penny and the Devil, you're right that 1762 is when the Italian version of Orfeo et Oiridice comes out. Um, Gluck moves to Paris, and so now he's having to write to an audience that doesn't speak Italian as their first language uh, or as their cultural language. They have French in, in their plays and all. So he works with a, a librettist by the name of Pierre-Louis Moline, and they take the Italian libretto and translate it into French, the entire opera. Another thing they also do is they change the character of Orpheus from an alto castrato, which was what you would do in an Italian opera, and they have what's called a haute contre. 
uh, high tenor uh, for the role in France. And so the French version comes from 1774. And so you will hear both versions uh, performed today uh, to the degree that they are. They're recordings of both the Italian and French versions. Um, but it's simply not an opera done as much in opera houses today. But it is an opera whenever you talk about Italian opera, you, you bump up against it and you have to address it because there's so many wonderful things that happen in that particular work. Mm. So here's a question uh, from, oh boy, uh, Itan Nobile, um, and it's a kind of a nuts and bolts question. Maybe I don't understand the instructions he's asking about peer review grading. I found quite a number of the submissions I read merited three points, but I was only able to enter a two or a four. Please advise. Yeah, so this is a this is a great question, and part of this was how we designed the rubric before when we were designing the course, and how we ended up actually building those rubrics into the edX platform. Um, so what we discovered once we got into the edX platform is even though we had these ranges set up for two to three or four to we had one to two, uh, three to four, five to six were the originals we had set up. Uh, we were unable to actually do that in the edX platform because they have to pick a point value instead of doing point ranges. Um, so this is something that we've adapted and we've been uh, grateful for, for people's patience as we've been working through this. The second half of the course for our variation of the opera tuning activity, the opera individual adventures, uh, those will be based on a one, two, three setup uh, for the actual point values. So hopefully that should clarify some of that going forward, but that's a great question. We appreciate the feedback and uh, thank you for working with us on that. Yeah, so um, obviously we've been learning a lot about Italian opera together, yeah. um, but we've also been learning a lot about how to run a MOOC together. And yeah. so some things uh, aren't as intuitive perhaps as we would have thought. So um, as Adam says, thanks for your understanding and flexibility. Uh, Marie Joy has another question that also re uh, relates to uh, the aspect of what's going on in the course. And she's mostly talking about, you know, where does the singing come into the grading mm -hmm. of assignments? So do you want to summarize your question? Yeah. So according to the to two peer reviewers of my first opportunity assignment, I should not have commented much on the singer's voice and interpretations. The focus should have been on Mozart's music. I think, though, that the delivery of the aria is part of the creation of the music because that is how listeners receive the music. That is how the music comes alive. What I learned about how music conveys drama depended a lot on the performance. Can we and should we separate music from its performance? Um, so, you know, we'll start with the last question. Can we separate music from its performance? Uh, this is a delicate question, but consider that uh, even if the work is never sung, we still have a score. Mm -hmm. And so we can look at the music on the page, imagine what it's sounding like, and make comments on it. So there is a place right there where we can separate music from a performance of the music. Uh, should we? Um, that's a judgment call. And what I would like to say is one of the things I've been pushing very hard on in this class is for us to work on separating music from the performance of the music. So again, in Mozart's case, where in, say, Vol Ballare, there are things that happen in the music regardless of the Figaro who sings it. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the things I think I want us to work on. And I understand it's very difficult and challenging not to get caught up in the wonder of uh, how people perform uh, a particular piece. But I want us to try and work and remain focused on developing this area of our musical expertise, our expertise so that we can talk about vocal interpretations, but the, the chief thing is what does Mozart or what does Verdi or what does Gluck handle Puccini? What are they doing in the music? And uh, then we can talk about the nuances between this performer and that performer, which is a whole different kind of conversation. Definitely good strategies. All right. So, um, We've been getting, uh, we had some in the first office hour questions about castrati. People seem to be energized in very interesting ways about this whole issue of uh, a performer that doesn't exist anymore. And so Miro J asked the question about modern castrati substitution and interpretation. So when producing operas that originally use castrati, how does the opera director and anyone else involved in the decision, such as the conductor, choose whether to use a transposed version, a mezzo, or a countertenor? 
Also, I'm wondering why you chose the particular interpretations and productions that you did for the lecture videos. For example, is there a reason you chose a mezzo rather than a countertenor for the handle clip? Um, what do you th what do you look for in an interpretation, vocal, orchestral, theatrical, or otherwise? All right. So, uh, first of all, I hope everybody enjoyed that particular production of uh, Julio Cesare. Mm. I, I just find it so imaginative, uh, so beautifully sung, uh, visually satisfying. Uh, so much of it works on so many different level levels. But the first thing I look for is, you know, is the music being done justice? Is it well played? Is it well sung? Is Handel being well represented? And so that's where I would start. Uh, as far as the, the question about, you know, do I choose a castrati? Or, and we, obviously we don't have castrati today. Do I choose a count, uh, someone singing in a countertenor role, uh, singing that as a countertenor or, or a mezzo? Um, I, I had an inter, in, uh, sorry uh, an exchange with a Dartmouth alum about this who's taking the class and that was offline and we're going to find a way to put that online and we'll we'll post a link to that in uh, the the announcement for week four that goes out I'm I'm looking at that I really hadn't told you that but we're, <laughs> you know we're going to find a place to post yeah. it online and then we'll direct people to that because a lot of people want to know the difference between castrati countertenors mezzi. Uh, what what should we do? I mean, the, the issue and um, the answer is, I mean, we have the same issues today as as people had 250 years ago, and that is, who's going to be the biggest box office draw, mm -hmm. and uh, how much do they cost, and are they available? Those were the questions 250 years ago. They're the same questions today, and so the question of, well, they chose a mezzo versus a countertenor. Um, well, it would be like they chose that castrato over that castrato, and so uh, it's they're similar questions that I think. Um, I hope that answer that I gave to this one individual will be useful to a lot of other persons. So William Bisgrove, a shout out to you. You're with us right now. You give us this live question. So um, we're gonna see how I do on the spot with on something spot. I've not seen before. I was wondering if you could talk a little about the general classification of vo voice types. I've seen a coloratura, a soprano, mezzo-soprano, et cetera. And I'm wondering if certain pieces are performed only by certain voice types. Okay, so we, I mean, we get into this whole uh, question of Fach is a German term, F-A-C-H, uh, and you know, a type of voice. And so, I, you know, there are all kinds of sopranos, for example, coloratura, lint, uh, lyric soprano, spinto. Uh, we could go on and on about, you know, these different kinds of uh, voices and what kind of operas are they best suited for. And um, tell you what we'll do is we'll put in the listener's toolbox some tools that you can go look at about these kind of voice types. Uh, the list is almost as long as there are people writing about opera. <laughs> and uh, again, when you think about the operas that we're looking at, for the most part, the composers were composing for specific people, not mm -hmm. specific voice types. And so, and when we're you know, we've been we're getting ready to go to Rossini, and Rossini is looking at uh, Giudita Pasta. That's one of her, his uh, you know one of his singers that he's writing for later on. Bellini then takes her over, and he's writing for that voice. And mm. so now then we're stuck with a score that maybe there are not people like Pasta who can sing it. And so sometimes they fall away, but sometimes they come back. Or you know, I think another example is if you listen to Cosi Fantute, uh, the role of uh, Fiora de Ligi, that, that woman who originated the part had a rather, not a very well-developed middle range, but she had a very strong low range and a very strong high range. Mm -hmm. And you listen to, you know, like when she sings Come Solio, uh, you know, and she's always bouncing around here. And it's just, a, you know, like remarkable. Like, who can do that? It was like, well, the, the woman who sang it at the original performance did. Now the rest of us are kind of stuck to try and do these kinds of things together. By the way, I just see something else. I'm kind of transitioning to something else. Thank you to whomever liked us on Facebook. We now have 500 oh, nice. likes on the Facebook <laughs> page. Good job. Good job. Good job, good job. Okay, so we have another question here, um, uh, also by Sadie uh, T. I think we just answered her one uh, earlier. Uh, she's asking about the particular performance, the Glyndebourne performance of Giulio Cesare that I posted on the um, for week two. I was fascinated by the, chore the choreography used during the instrumental parts of Caesar's aria in the Glyndebourne opera version of Julius Caesar 
in Egypt. It struck me as designed to make the staging more acceptable for modern audiences. How would this have been staged in Handel's time? Would audiences at that time have expected dance or stage movement during the aria, or would they have simply accepted the orchestral sections as a normal musical convention? So first of all, you know, here I'm teaching a, a course on Italian opera, and uh, you, those of you who have done the work and looked at my biography know that I'm not primarily an opera scholar. I love opera, and I've done a lot of reading about it. But So let me stipulate that I'm not a scholar of Handel operas. I'd invite people to go look at the work of Ellen Harris, a colleague of mine who's written a lot about Handel and what he was writing for. Uh, I would say that... You know, uh, directors today are more obliged than directors of 200 years ago to have action on stage. And that's partly because we have grown up in a world of movies and video. Mm. And so uh, those of us who saw the recent production of La Noce di Figaro that the Met put on will remember that the overture had an entire oh, you know, right. movement during that. And that would probably not have happened in Mozart's day. You know, probably it was there to quiet down the audience who were continuing to fill the seats during the overture. So there were different needs at different times in opera's history in terms of what would happen. So, so um, as far as that movement in the Glyndebourne production, I really liked it. So that dance, uh, as you know, they were kind of walking, you know, say, uh, uh, Julius uh, Caesar and, and Ptolemy, it's like they're stalking one another, which is mm -hmm. part of the whole notion of the horn playing, the, the going after the prey and, and the hunter. So I, I think that direction gives us that sense as well. So it, to me, it was a, a marvelous integration of the music, the singing, and what we were seeing on stage. We've got a question on the cantabile and cabaletta, you know, those kind of bread and butter things. And I should say, before I answer this, um, just a, a few days ago, we added some new parts to the cantabile cabaletta section of the website. So mm -hmm. I would encourage people to go back. You know, this was in response to one of our um, uh, students who asked for certain kind of things, didn't see them immediately, and so we, we made it a little bit more transparent how to find these things. But here's a question about cantabile and cabaletta. From time to time when I listen to a cantabile, it is not as slow or sad as I expect, and sometimes a cabaletta is slower than I expect. I get them confused when they are not extreme versions of their class. Is there a method to tell them apart when they are somewhere in the middle at least to my ear. So this is a, a great question. So you know, you have a, f a faster cantabile and a slower cabaletta. So you know what's going on there. And the, the basic thing is the structure never really changes. You've got the cantabile followed by the cabaletta, and that's what we're looking for. And so it's the, again, the anticipation of the convention that's mm -hmm. starting to happen in the 19th century. Um, that you have an aria that begins with a slower part and then it's followed by a faster part. We really didn't talk about that distinction when we were looking at Una po Voce Poco Fa because it's not as clearly delineated at that point. But if you go back and think about that aria, it starts out with the slower part and then mm -hmm. it ends with a faster part. So this is the convention that's developing. Now, um, does it happen that some of the cantabiles move more rapidly than some others like some others do? That does happen. But it's just to prime people to listen for the narrative parts, which are more like recitative, as then the aria parts. And is it, you know, what part did it come in? Was it the first part? Likely then it's a cantabile. Uh, then we had another narrative recitative like moment, followed by another aria part. That's likely the cabaletta. Now, having said this, you know, I just listened to, uh, uh, afresh to Bellini's Norma. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the fun things there is how. Bellini plays with this convention. So in, at the opening of Act Two, uh, we get uh, a recitative-like section, and then Norma sings her what sounds like the cantabile, and then she uh, breaks into a cabaletta, but the cabaletta gets truncated, uh, doesn't even get a chance to finish. And so it's the anticipation of how these forms will, you know, are typically used, and then how those uh, anticipations are thwarted. Again, my, my thing at the very beginning that if it was all novel, we'd be completely confused. But if it was all predictable, we'd be completely bored. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, enjoy it. the fact that composers every now and then play with this convention in ways, uh, including with the tempo of these arias. So this was, I, I like this question uh, by Jennifer K. Thompson. Uh, 
thank you, Jennifer, for continuing to send your questions in. I hope you're you're enjoying our answers. So uh, she titled this question, Unsung Words in the Libretto, with a question mark. In the lecture on arias, you say, in Italian opera, unlike some national opera act conventions, almost all the words of the libretto are sung. Does that mean that in some national operatic conventions, some of the words of the libretto are, are spoken, or that there are words in the libretto that never are heard at all? Either way, can you provide some examples of what you are alluding to here? Okay, so as I said, a great question. So. Here we've been dealing with Italian opera, and you'll, if we go back to Monteverdi, you will remember that um, we had a difference between the stile rappresentativo uh, with kind of dance-like moments. And so, uh, but the idea in Italian opera has always been that everything would be sung, but that's not the convention in other other places. And so, in the late 19th, uh, sorry, the late 18th century, especially, uh, there were two main operatic conventions where there were spoken words. One was in France and the other was in German-speaking countries, where the narrative portions, which we are experiencing in Italian opera as recitative, are spoken. And so when I teach the French opera tradition, uh, we, we almost immediately come up against a challenge of nomenclature, of words, because the French convention uh, is called opera comique, which people think, oh, that must be comic opera. But no, opera comique is a kind of opera where there are arias and then the narrative is often spoken. Mm. So in Carmen, in 1875, Bizet's Carmen, originally all of the narrative was spoken. Uh, Bizet died and then somebody else came around and then set all that to music. Mm. But in the original, it was spoken. So, I mean, that's, that's a convention that goes well into the 19th century for France. In the German tradition, we have what's called a Singspiel, which is a kind of a song play. And uh, the most famous, you know, for our uh, world, I guess, one of the most famous Singspiele is uh, Die Zauberflöte, the magic flute, uh, mm -hmm. that has a uh, you know, number of arias, duets, ensembles, but then everything is spoken to weave the whole story together. The Zingspiele tradition died out a little bit more rapidly than the opera comique tradition did, but we go all the way to Fidelio in Beethoven's time, and he's got spoken text knitting these uh, uh, parts together. Also, we find that in um, one of the great German operas, Die Freischütz of Weber, and then after that, we start having German composers uh, setting everything to music. And so Wagner, starting in the 1840s, uh, has everything to, uh, to music. But, uh, and I should say in, in finishing this, that we have moments in Italian opera where things are spoken. Uh, and so in act three of La Traviata, when uh, Violetta gets the letter from Alfredo, it's kind of like a melodrama as the orchestra goes on underneath. And, and Violetta reads the text uh, mm -hmm. of the letter that she's received. And even farther forward in Chile's Adriana Le Couvreur, uh, where uh, Adriana, the title character, she's an actress, she's pr practicing her lines before she goes out on stage and she reads them or she speaks them. But it's also very dramatic kind of speaking. So um, mostly in Italian opera, everything is sung, but in other conventions, um, you would have spoken parts. One more piece on this. I'm sorry, that was already a long answer, but uh, Jennifer asked about words in the libretto that are never heard at all. So, I, I mean, that. so what happens, obviously, is that you've got an, a composer and a librettist, and they're working together, and so the librettist gives, uh, here are the words right now, and the composer says, I don't want those words. Cross out these words. Add this. I need this happening here. And so they go back and forth and back and forth. But by the time the opera is finished and the libretto is published, the li published libretto pretty much matches what's being sung on the page. Mm -hmm. I mentioned, I think, in talking about the end of Act One of La Traviata, that originally the uh, cantabile has two verses. And so both verses are both in the score and both in the libretto, mm -hmm. but in performance, you don't hear normally that second verse. So there are moments when the words in the libretto aren't actually sung, but that's uh, both because of drafts that uh, have gone before, as well as because of um, conventions that happen in stage here. Mm -hmm. So we have another question that just came in live, um, and the, it's a very great question. You know, um, you want to from Cecil M X or Ceci M X. Does the score have stage directions? So um, 
And this would depend you know, on the composer as well as the work with the librettist. And let's imagine the farther back we go in time, that it's less likely that we had, you know, explicit stage directions. So cross here, uh, come to the front of the stage. Um, and even if uh, the librettist and the composer agree upon what the stage direction should be, where a singer should be or a character should be, um, the director who's controlling the traffic may look at the those directions and say, I can't get that to work. Mm. And so we'll do something else. Uh, this is not Italian opera, but I think uh, of uh, Tristan und Isolde at the very end where Tristan has died. Isolde sings her marvelous um, a Liebes Tod, her you know, song of love and death. And then she dies. And the, the stage directions that Wagner provides is that, uh, that the two bodies are intertwined, become a tree that reaches up into the heavens. Now, <laughs> I have no idea how you would <laughs> you make that, that work. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, turn them into soil and green, perhaps, and then you <laughs> can get it done. Um, but um, that's not going to happen. And so, um, so the stage directions are suggestions, probably more than prescriptions mm -hmm. on how to make an opera work. But uh, yes, very often the, core, the, 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 uh, the, the score itself will say that uh, you know, the singer sings this as an aside or uh, you know, something like that. So they, they, those things do exist, but uh, directors and singers are free to ignore them. It's a great question. So uh, unless we get one more live question, this looks like our last question of our office hour. And it deals with coloratura, Cadenza and bel canto, three words that have C's in them. I think maybe that's the yeah. question. Do, do all opera words have C's in them? Is that what the question is, Adam? <laughs> yeah, no. But oh, okay. close. So uh, what are differences between coloratura, cadenza, and bel canto? And when Violetta in La Traviata sings those solos, are all of them a cadenza? So um, I, can I, I tend to start answering the last question first. So uh, no, all the things that uh, Violetta sings are not cadenzas. Mm -hmm. And cadenza is a particular form within a convention, the larger operatic conventions, which we were talking about in week three. So the cadenza happens uh, typically at the end of a cantabile and uh, sometimes at the end of a, a cabaletta as well. In the case of uh, Sempre Libera, it happens between the two verses of the canta of the cabaletta. And basically a cadenza is when the orchestra drops out and the singer keeps on going. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what makes something a cadenza. Uh, we have cadenzas also in um, when a, an instrumentalist plays with an orchestra. And so the orchestra drops out. And the idea of a cadenza is that it's improvisatory. And so um, in most of our operatic uh, cadenzas, the composer has written it out. In a lot of earlier piano concertos, for example, Mozart's Day, Beethoven's Day, uh, people were free to improvise on the spot hmm. what it is that they wanted to do. And I think singers would also come with their ideas of, okay, I'm going to add these vocal flourishes mm -hmm. uh, when the orchestra drops out because I can do whatever I want to. Um, but composers you know, begin to restrict what singers can do and pianists can do as well. So that's what a cadenza is. Um, now, uh, the question about coloratura, um, a technical term uh, used to describe florid, highly ornamental singing. And so again, if we look at the end of act one of uh, La Traviata and the, the cantabile, uh, A Forse Lui, that doesn't have uh, much coloratura, if any, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, and then it has a cadenza, and then we get that middle part, the tempo di mezzo, mm -hmm. uh, where she says, folia, folia. And then um, when she sings gioia, uh, the orchestra is completely gone. That's the cadenza, and it's pretty coloratura esque. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, she you know, expresses her love in the time of coloratura for the freedom that she's going to have in, um, you know, ignoring Alfredo and uh, the Sempre Libera is just sparkling with coloratura. The last part here, bel canto, it describes a style of singing. So um, uh, cadenza, coloratura, uh, cantabile, cabaletta, all of these exist within the world of bel canto, beautiful singing. Mm -hmm. And so Rossini, Bellini, Donizetti, the, the chief exponents of bel canto singing as well as Verdi, early Verdi. Um, these are kind of where we look when we think of coloratura. I'm looking here, it looks like another question has just come in. And so uh, we'll answer this and then we're gonna be done for the day, all right? So 
here's a live question. Um, why don't you go ahead and read it? Yeah. How are you finding the experience of teaching online? The class is a lot of fun, but I would think the mostly asynchronous nature of this is a challenging. Um, is a challenge. Is a challenge. Uh, versus in, in person. So so I think one of the things that makes it uh, less challenging or more fun for us is doing something like this live office hour. So this this actually responds, as you just saw, to a live question. And so we have an opportunity to try and be synchronous with the mm -hmm. learning that's happening in the class. But yes, this it's a little bit different than what I would be accustomed to. I there's no way for you all to know this, but you know all the videos for weeks one, two, and three were filmed before the middle of March, and so you know we've been pulling these things together, and making them ready for you. But uh, we have been planning this entire class for a year. Has it been more than a year? It's a year now? in the making. Now. A year yeah. in the making now, and. And as you can see, we're still engaged in it. We, we've not let it completely go on its own. Um, and I'm really grateful to the questioner here to say that the class has been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been a lot of work uh, for us, but it also has been a lot of fun. And we've been enjoying and learning from the asynchronous, asynchronous nature of it, you know, how we best uh, encourage people to uh, get into the learning whenever they can, uh, mm -hmm. but also then to have a thread and encourage people along the way. Well, what, what more would you add to that, Adam? Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting for me to think about this. In my role as an instructional designer, this is something we tend to think about a lot. Um, previous to my role here at Dartmouth, I worked in, a little bit in distance, distance learning, which was primarily asynchronous in its nature. Um, it's great because with asynchronous learning experiences, we can give learners the flexibility to approach it on their own schedules, um, to figure out their learning experience based around their needs, but then adding in these synchronous components and the the moderated components in the course are really key to thinking about how we guide the instructional experience for the students and, and how that's shaped for them. So it's definitely, I'm glad this question came up. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, teaching online can be a challenge, but it, it can be really rewarding, especially at scale like this. All right. So when we were planning this office hour, the question came, you know, we, the first office hour took about an hour. Uh, and we, we, just so people know out there, we spent three hours planning for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this was already a, a change for us. We only spent two hours planning on this one. So we got a little bit better. And we were asking ourselves how long this office hour would be. And we were thinking maybe 30 minutes, probably 45. And I'm looking at my clock. <laughs> you and were, we're right coming, on it. We're right on 45 minutes. So we're, <laughs> we're, at, we're now at the end of our time together. And we have a couple of thank yous that we need to give. Yeah, so uh, thank you to Jones Media Center for allowing us to use your, your space and your innovation studio. It's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you to our media producer, Dan Maxwell Crosby, who's behind the camera. Thank you to Memory of Pata Brady for, for facilitating the course and bringing in the questions in real time. Uh, thank you, Mike Gadsward, for being our, our feed master in chief. Uh, I uh, go ahead. Controlling, you know, what you're seeing at any given time between us and the slides. And so I um, want to thank you, Adam, for being on this stage and being willing to answer some of the questions and organizing everything and getting the word out to folks to ask their questions and or and uh, bring them to the fore. And thank you, Steve. I know this is difficult to schedule and to get in, but I, I love doing this with you. I love hanging out and doing the, the live stuff. It's fun. All right. So I think the next time we're doing this, we, we're still working on this, right? We're, Trying to figure we're out where still we're... firming up a date. Um, we're having some issues. We were originally thinking about doing one on the week of the 16th, but we might have to play around a little bit with that uh, based around some scheduling. Um, but we'll definitely have at least one or two more during the course. That's right. Like the Terminator, we'll be back. We'll be back. All right. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Right. And uh, look forward to uh, engaging with you all in the course and look for an update uh, via course email tomorrow. Right. Andiamo. Enjoy your opera. Take care.